And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Let the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. As you can see on the front of the bulletin, the title of today's message is The Salvation of Your Souls. Your soul. Your eternal spirit. That God breathed life into you. And that is what God is most concerned about. It's something that Peter brings up today in this letter. And I just wanted to focus on these two verses because Peter says two remarkable things. He talks about the love that he saw in the believers as he traveled around the Roman Empire from Jerusalem on his way to Rome. He was amazed at the different churches that he saw and the love that they had for Christ and the love that they had for one another. And then he, he concludes this part of the letter with saying that the purpose of your faith, the purpose of your love for the Lord, the purpose of the way he's called you is all for the goal of the salvation of your soul. The way he says it is receiving the end result. Other versions say the goal of your salvation is the salvation of your soul, your eternal destiny in heaven. Um, this morning, as we go into this letter now, um, we remember that Peter is an old man. He has traveled from Jerusalem to Rome. He wanted to go to Rome to see the big city, to see the big capital that's conquered the entire known world, and to take the gospel there. He's probably in his mid to late 60s, and uh, he knows that the Apostle Paul is there. And he wanted to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles right in the, Ro right in the heart of the Roman Empire, right in the heart of paganism and materialism and a godless society. Peter had gotten very brave as he grew into the shoes of being an apostle. You know, he spent most of his time in Jerusalem, Judea, that area. He went over to Philistine and other places, Joppa and other places to also reach out to Gentiles. And he was the pastor and evangelist there in that area, Judean area, for many, many years. But towards the end of his life, he was brave enough to make that journey and go through all those different lands on his way to Rome, up around the Mediterranean Sea. Paul had made that trip many times as a missionary pastor, three or four times, but this was Peter's first time. Now what's fascinating is Peter notices something, as mentioned here in verse 8. He says here, though you've not seen him, you love him, talking about Christ. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. It's interesting that Peter would mention this, because what happened was, as he traveled and it took many weeks to make that journey, if not months, because you're walking and you're going by boat and it's slow going. But he visited so many churches that were planted by Paul and Barnabas and Silas. He was pulling up the rear as these churches had grown, following the steps of Paul. And he had seen all these different churches in Asia Minor and, and in Ephesus and, and all the churches mentioned in Revelation. Matter of fact, he mentions at the top of the letter he says, in the province of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And as he traveled all these places, he met all these believers. And he was amazed by something. That they loved the Lord Jesus. That they believed in him. This was significant for Peter because Peter had actually seen, talked, and walked, and ate with the living Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Peter, as you know his story, had really stumbled in his faith. He had trouble fully grasping his calling. He had retreated when the hour got dark, when Christ was crucified. He retreated in his faith and denied the Lord three times. And then when he went running to the tomb that Easter morning, he walked out of the empty tomb, as we recall from that message on Easter Sunday morning, that he was a bit bewildered and said in the text he wondered what had happened. So he had stumbled in his faith, he had denied Christ, he was uncertain of the resurrection, and then he went back to fishing. He wanted to go back to what was comfortable, what was safe, what he knew. And of course, Jesus Christ had to come and find him by the Sea of Galilee and recall him to his ministry, to his 
calling as an apostle. So Peter had the great benefit of walking and talking with the Lord, the living Lord Jesus Christ. But now he meets all these people that he says, you've never seen him like I did. And yet I see that you believe in him. Not only do you believe in him, but you love him. I think this was remarkable to Peter. I'm meeting these people who never saw and talked with the Lord like I have. But they believe in him, though they never saw him. And they not only believe, but they love him. They love the Lord. This is really crucial for us as believers. It poses a question to us. Do we love the Lord? Believing in Him is one thing, but loving Him, I think, is another thing. To love Him and to grow in love with Him and to worship Him and to want to spend time in His Word. When you spend time in His Word, you spend time with Jesus. When you spend time in His house, you spend time with Jesus. When you spend time with His people, you spend time loving Jesus. To love others is to love the Lord. And so Peter was really surprised by the love and the belief that he saw, especially concerning his own journey. I remember it was the love of the Lord, the love of God, that turned the key for me, that unlocked the door. Because as you know, I was born and raised a son of a pastor, son of a priest. I was born and raised in a Christian home. Heard all the Bible stories. Went to church two, three times a week. And knew all about it. And of course, I was in large churches where my dad pastored. And the hustle and bustle of people and ministry. I mean, back then in the 70s, 60s and 70s, I mean, churches were full. I mean, in the 60s, everybody went to church. It was expected. You know, these are churches of a thousand or more people. There was the hustle and bustle of the church. And... As a little boy scuffling around the church, you know, I wasn't paying attention much to the love of God, though I noticed certain people were more sweet than others. <laughs> and, um, but I don't know what my problem was, but, you know, at the age of 15, I checked out of church, checked out of my Christian family, began to follow my older brother Sean around town, and just ran with a bad crowd. And I won't go into ugly details, but I did a lot of bad things. And I wouldn't go to church. So fast forward eight years later, I'm 23. I end up in Tucson, Arizona, living in a sh adobe shack on the wrong side of town. And it reached the bottom of my barrel. But the long, long arm of the Lord is going to come and rescue me. Because I belong to him. I didn't know that, but he knew that. So he came looking for me. The, the chain of events that happened was I met someone at this party who just became born again, invited me to their church, this little charismatic chapel, much like this one on, on the bad side of Tucson. And so I felt prompted to go. Long story short, you know, I was very hesitant. I, I you know, uh, I was pretty messed up. And, uh, but I went. Long story short, I spent a year with these people. And of course, I knew the truth that I heard preach, that I heard them talking about. But what made a significant impact on me was their love for Christ, and their love for each other, and their love for me. I was overwhelmed by it. You know, uh, you could feel it right when you walked in. And of course, uh, back then, the service went for a good hour and a half, and then people would stay for another hour after that, fellowshipping, and then they'd go out to dinner, and they'd spend the whole day together. And uh, I just, it really impacted me how much they loved me. Um, there was a large uh, group of young adults between the ages of 17 and 25, about 20 of them, 25 of them, and, and, I, and they were my age. And see, I, I come from the dark side of the world, and so when I met them, I thought, wow, these young adults are so different. They're like bright, they're beautiful, they're happy, they're friendly, they're peaceful, they love me. They, they call me by name, and they look me in the eye, and they want to hang out with me. I was, and we're not drinking or doing drugs, we're going to the bar, it was, but we're having a great time. And you know why? It was the love of God, the love of Christ in their hearts. And this is exactly what Peter is saying. He says, even though you've not seen him, you believe in him. Even though you've not seen him like I have, you love him. And I see it in you. 
And Peter brings it up. And, uh, you know, I began to hang out with these young adults, and I began to see that Jesus was real. Okay? He's not just this book, this person on a page, or this person in a book called the Bible that I had heard for 15 years. He's actually a living, breathing, walking Jesus Christ on the planet who changes people's lives and changes the lives of these young people and wanted to change my life. And when I hung out with these young people, they were into the Bible. And that's what they did for fun. They met at, they, they had this rotating Bible study where they'd meet, take turns meeting in each other's apartments. And they would just sit around for like two hours reading and talking about the Bible. So I was going to these. And I was thinking, this is so different from what I was used to for the past couple of years. I said, these people truly love God. They truly love His Word. This is really remarkable. This is not put on. They didn't have to do that. And then they were going on missions trips, you know. They said, hey, Troy, we're going to hop in the pickup and go down south of the border into Mexico and feed the starving children. Do you want to go with us? I said, yeah, I went with them. You know, I was used to the buddies hopping in the pickup trucks and going on an all-day drinking binge. These kids were a lot different than that. And uh, so I went on mission trips with them, and I saw their genuine love of God because of their genuine love for people. We went into these villages, and all they had were tents and dirt and bottles of water. That's it. They were lucky to have shoes on their feet. We would take them shoes and take them water and take them clothes. And I saw the way these young people in Christ serving the Lord in a different place. It was really quite remarkable. The leader of this group, his name was Ron. And you've heard me talk about him before. He had long, shaggy blonde hair, blue eyes. He was kind of strong. Kind of looked like King David to me. He was like a blonde-haired Jesus. And uh, we had gone on one of these outings and together, just for fun. And uh, we went up to the top of this mountain to go to have lunch by the lake and maybe go swim in the lake. Long story short, I swam too far out, and I started to drown. And Ron jumped in and saved my life. This, this Ron who loved Jesus wasn't going to let Troy drown. And he risked his life going out there in this cold, deep lake. I was right in the middle, drowning, and he swam out, saved me, and pulled me to shore. See, with stuff like that, it's like, these people are different. They're different. They're risking, to, they're risking their life to save my life. They're going south of the border to, to feed poor children. They didn't have to do that. They get together every week for Bible study, and they love it. And then I go to church on Sunday, and they're like at a rock concert, having that kind of fun. It, it made a difference. And so in the simple verse where Peter says the same thing that he noticed, I noticed, and he noticed that even though you never saw him, you believe in him. Even though you never saw him, you loved him. And it's something that impressed Peter, and he brings it up here in the verse. Now, what's important about love is that it reveals that we love Christ. And it's so very important. So very important. The Apostle John puts it this way, the importance of love through the believers to other people. The Apostle John puts it this way. We love, we love others around us because he first loved us. Jesus first loved us. That's why we love others. Because we see the love that he has for us. When you see the love that Christ has for you, it changes you. That's what changed me. I confessed my sins to the Lord. I knew what he did at the cross. But as I began to read the Bible, I saw, it, it, it impacted me more and more that God would become a man in this filthy, dirty, immoral place, subject himself to ungodly, wicked men, to the Romans, and be crucified on a cross in his underwear and bleed out on a cross outside his city of Jerusalem. And you can't look at that seriously and be the same. When you see what Christ has done for you, it changes you. So while he loves me like that, 
And so it behooves you to love other people in the same way. That's why the Apostle John, who knew Jesus Christ face to face, voice to voice, friend to friend. The Apostle John says, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sisters is a liar. Wow, that's strong preaching, John. For whoever does not love his brother or sister whom they have seen, listen to the way he puts it, cannot love God whom they've not seen. And that's something that Peter brings up. They've not seen the Lord like I did. But yet they love one another. See, Christ changed them even though they're on the other side of the empire, the other side of the world. The love of God changed them. And now John brings it up as really a command. In the Greek, it's a command. Talking about you must love your brothers and sisters. If you say you love God whom you've not seen, you need to love your brother and sister who you do see sitting right next to you. And he has given us this command. So he makes it clear. He says it's a command. And he's given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and their sister. And love is manifested in the way that I just told you the story about the young people I met on the backside of Tucson, Arizona. They would look in your face, call you by name, give you a hug, invite you out for a meal, invite you to the Bible study, invite you for the outing. They're going on an outing today. Are we going because we love one another? Invite me to a mission trip, invite me to church, invite me to a Christian concert, invite me to their home for dinner. I want our church, I'm, I'm starting to talk to the leaders, the, the co-leaders of the different ministries and also the council, the leaders here at the church, about, I want our church to become a tight family of love, an overwhelming, love-filled family. We're a family of worship on Sunday and also a family of love. I want us to be a, a family of fellowship and of faith and of love at some point during the week, too, where we get together, we make time to get together. You know, in the book of Acts, they did, at this church that was experiencing revival in Tucson back in 1986, they did. Here, I've seen that blossom and grow, and I want to see it to grow more. And we, we are a family of faith, a family of love, a family of fellowship, along with being a family of worship. You know, there's a lot of churches, and here's what happens. They become a Sunday morning only church. We'll go on Sunday morning. We'll make time, if we can, for Sunday morning. But don't expect much more, Pastor, because we're too busy, too distracted, too discouraged, too disappointed. And we don't make time for the family of faith. We don't make time for the fellowship of believers. We don't take time to love one another. It's a command, by the way. It's a command to love one another. A command. And John says, how can you say you love God whom you've not seen, but not love your brother and sister whom you do see right in front of you? That's a dichotomy. You're a liar. So, as a Bible teacher here in this place, teaching the scripture at face value and repeating the commands of the Apostle John as you're repeating the commands of Jesus Christ, I have to repeat these commands to you. Love is more than just, hey, how you doing, love you. <laughs> no, it's engaging, it's investing, it's making time, it's putting on your calendar, it's showing up. Love shows up. Love is proven by showing up. You can say, I love you, I love you, and be sweet as syrup. But if you don't show up, mm, I don't know if God believes you or not. That's what the Bible says. And I feel the urge for this church to connect in fellowship greatly. I think a church is only as strong as our relationships. Therefore, we've got to make time to show up for the Thursday night Bible study, to show up for the Saturday work day, to show up for the special outing that the girls put together. My heavens, they're only doing it once a year. Can you show up? 
or to show up for the special fellowship outings that we're going to have planned this next church year. To put it on the calendar and, and make it a priority to be a part of the body of Christ in a fellowship way where you're investing yourself in the lives of other people. We are the family of faith. We've got a lot of family and a lot of friends and a lot of neighbors and a lot of co-workers out there, but they're not part of the faith, are they? Most of them aren't. We are the ones that are going to live together forever. We should be enjoying that now. So I found it really interesting that Peter talks about, man, what I notice is that you love one another and that you love God and you never even saw the guy like I did. And when I saw him, I was struggling. You guys don't seem to be struggling at all when Peter saw these people in, in Bithynia and in Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia. He was impressed. I've been impressed and changed by the love of God. I want people who come in here, the reason I'm preaching this to you, preaching the word of God to you so that you hear it and let it transform you into a church that makes Christ happy and makes him used and makes us useful in his hands, is that we need to hear these words and apply these words and become a church that's strong in fellowship, strong in relationship, strong in love. And you know what? We just need to get over ourselves. <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to, you know, sometimes I'm going to be a little bit edgy. Um, well, when you read Paul and John and Jesus, I mean, they're very edgy, very edgy. Some of the things they say in their sermons, I'm like, ooh, I don't know if I want to say that. <laughs> you know, but, but in all honesty, we, we need to kind of get over ourselves and make time for one another. I know our calendars are crazy. It's like, I know every one of you sitting here, and if this place was full, everyone sitting here would be saying in their mind, listening to my voice, saying, mm, Pastor, that's good for everyone else, not for me. You don't know my schedule. You don't know my calendar. You don't know my troubles. You don't know what's going on in my family or at work. You just don't know, Pastor. You don't get it. No, no, I get it. I, I get it. And what you and I need to get is what John said. Love one another. It is a command. If you say you love God but don't love your brother or sister, you're a liar. How does love show up? What does it do? It gets involved. It gets invested. It spends time. It reaches out. See, that's what made the difference for me in, those, in that fellowship on the bad side of Tucson with those young people who loved me and took me out and took care of me and saved my life one day. I saw, I saw a group of people who spent their time differently, spent their calendar differently, invested their lives, took the time, proved their love. Not just talked about it on Sunday morning, like, ah, oh, Troy, love you, see ya. No, they took me out for lunch and they spent time, we went on mission trips. They invested, they took time. And somehow we have to do that. So it says here that you love him and you love one another, and I see that I'm really impressed by that. He goes on to say that he, he ends by saying, you love him and believe in him, and you are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Okay, can't, I almost missed that. I don't want to miss that. Because like on a day like today, you know, we're a little bit down, there's a lot going on, things in our life that are discouraging, that there's some people here in the congregation that are going through a tough time. They're very discouraging. Life is not only life is not always happy and easy or fun. So that means we're gonna be kind of down in the mouth, bummed out and depressed all our life. That's not what this says. Peter was talking to people who had the same problems you do. It was just a different place and a different time and a different culture, but they had the same problems. He says here, a inexpressible and glorious joy. Well, you're like pastor. I don't know if I've seen that joy or felt that kind of joy. Where is that joy? I'd like to have some of that. You know, the joy comes from the Lord. The more that we love him, spend time with him, read his words, spend time in prayer, spend time in fellowship, we're filled with his presence, his peace, and his joy. A lot of times the most joy I feel is when I'm preaching, 
or when I'm worshiping the Lord, or when I'm witnessing. All, the, all have to do with the Lord and spiritual things. And sometimes that joy carries you over the hump. Sometimes that peace gets you through the dark hour. Supernatural peace. You know, Peter's talking about supernatural peace, supernatural joy. It's not generated naturally. Don't, don't rely on you. Rely on him. And he gives you the peace, the strength, and the joy that you need. So I'm in the hospital room with Virginia. The neuro ICU at Loyola. You know, I go to hospital. <laughs> Honestly, I never liked going to hospitals. But now I've learned that that's where I'm going to spend half of my time. You know, because I'm a minister of the gospel and I meet people on death's door and I pray for their soul, I pray for their peace, I pray for their recovery, I share the gospel with them. And whenever it's a believer, there's peace in the room. There's peace in their eyes. And here's Virginia. And she had joy. Honest to goodness, joy in her eyes. And she's in this bed with these tubes and wires and machines, and they drill into her head. You know, they're, she had brain surgery. And she's stuck in this bed for weeks. And, um, but she loved to pray. She loved to hear the word. She had a peace and a joy. And it's supernatural. Now, whether we're in a hospital bed or just going through our daily life, you can have that joy and that strength. It's, it's not unreasonable. I mean, Peter says here that because you believe, because you love him, you have inexpressible and glorious joy. I've seen it. So Peter's at these churches in like Thyatira, Bithynia, Galatia, Pontus. It's at these churches. He's saying, wow, you people have some joy going on. You have the love of God in your eyes, and it's impressive. And it's because why? They believe in Jesus. So maybe if we believe in Jesus more, we have more joy. It's because you love Jesus and love one another. So maybe if we love Jesus more and love one another more, we have more joy. I think they're connected. You know, I think as Christians, we have a decision to make. Are we going to walk and talk with the Lord each day? Are we going to invest our time and our energy in the body of Christ? Are we going to show up? Are we going to get invested? Are we going to engage? Because that's what I see here. And that's what Peter was impressed with. And that's what changed my life. See, I was in church. I did the church thing. And it wasn't until I saw the love of God in people's eyes and they proved it to me by the way they lived that I began to take Jesus serious. I thought, these people think Jesus is real. Do I think Jesus? I heard about Jesus. I know the story of Jesus. I could retell you the story of Jesus. But do I think he's real? And then one night, I found out he was. And man, did that change my life. I said, oh my word, if I miss time, I'm 23, I have missed time. I grabbed the Bible and started to read it. I started to pray. I started to go to church because I wanted to. And there's a difference. <laughs> and I began to love people like never before. Loved my parents for the first time, probably, when I came back home. Because I put them through hell. Yeah, that's a, a straight way to say it. And I, and I beg for their forgiveness. That's a changed life. And Peter's talking about changed lives that he saw. And part of that was the love that they had and the joy that they had. And that's what a Christian is about, love and joy. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. Well, he says now the result of this belief and this love and this joy he says here, and you are receiving as the end result of this changed life and this glorious life, the end result is the salvation of your souls. The salvation of your souls. You know, this whole story started there. Your soul. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says that God created the man from the dust of the earth. 
He created man in his own image, he created him. From the dust, the dirt, the clay of the earth. Formed a human sculpture out of clay. Verse 7, Genesis 2. And the Lord Jesus Christ, greater of all things, according to Colossians chapter 1, <coughs> breathed into him the breath of life, and he became an eternal being. Jesus has given every one of us the breath of life and an eternal soul. Started with Adam and has continued up until today. And that's why Peter says, this is all through Christ for the salvation of your soul. Because when God gives you a soul, guess what? It lasts forever. Ever. It's the breath of God. We're walking around with the breath of God. Why do you think you're alive? You know, you're about 80% water and 10% dirt. You're standing at 5'11", walking and talking and walking around. What do you think keeps you alive? According to Colossians chapter 1, it says that we all, we all live and breathe and have our meaning in Jesus Christ. He is the creator of all things, and all things have their meaning in him, and all things will have their culmination in him. So this is all about Jesus Christ. And so if he made us and give us the breath of life and give us an eternal soul, and if we believe in him and have eternal life and a new creation, if we love him and love one another, then that is what it's about, and that's what Peter is speaking to us today. The soul is so very important. The soul is so very important. Jesus put it this way. Jesus said to his disciples and the people gathered around, whoever wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever wants to lose their life for me will find it. Lose your life. <coughs> Make time on your calendar. Get involved. Get invested. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his very soul? This is another interesting statement Jesus makes. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You going to stand before the Father and try to barter with him over your soul? What, wait, 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 wait. I, I know I didn't believe in Jesus. You know, I know I ignored church and I hated Christians, but wait, 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 wait. I, I'm very wealthy. I got, I can come up with 10 mil right now. I got multiple properties. I'm a well-respected executive at the top top one percenters. Wait, wait, wait. Let me buy my way out of this. As a preacher, let me tell you and let me tell the world, that's not going to work. No, that's why Jesus says this. What will man give in exchange for his soul? The salvation of your soul. What if a man gains the whole world but loses his own soul? It's all about where your soul will spend eternity, according to Jesus. It says here, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. Oh, really? Jesus is returning? He's bringing angels with? Yeah. Yeah, see, that's the reality. Not this nonsense that you see going on in TV or at the club or in the neighborhood. No, Jesus is coming back in his Father's glory with his angels. And what is he going to be concerned with? And then he will reward each person according to what he has done. See, that's what I need to preach. You will be rewarded for what you've done. Making time in your calendar for what you've done. It's easy to get consumed with our life and go about our lives week after week, month after month, year after year. And we don't invest, we don't engage, we don't truly love. And so the soul is very important. Peter says, all of this is going to end with the goal, with the end result of the salvation of your soul. The salvation of your soul. I'm going to end now here in the last minute. And I want to read for you a passage of scripture. Oh, here it is. Okay, so the salvation of your soul. All right, Pastor Troy, what does the Bible say about where our soul goes? And why is that so great? 
What's going to happen to our soul in eternity? Once again, the Apostle John says it this way. Looking into heaven, looking into eternity, looking at what our souls will be doing. Listen to what it says. Revelation 20, verse 9. I saw thrones. The Apostle John is in heaven. He's describing what he saw. This is where we're going, by the way. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. He's talking about men. Men are given thrones and authority to judge. And I saw the souls. Wait, what did he say? I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. That's what happens at the end of time, by the way. Those who believe in Christ will be beheaded. They had not worshipped the beast or his image or had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life. Resurrection. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. That's the second resurrection that Paul and John talk about. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. Interesting. The second death, what is that? When you die, you're thrown into hell. And all the apostles and prophets say it's a second way to die. You think dying's bad? Wait till you're thrown into hell. You die twice. That's what they say. And i got to repeat it in 2022. I, like, I know that nobody wants to hear this. But you know what? I speak for him. And I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to say it as clear and as sober and as compassionate as I can. Even in a day where people don't want to hear it. It says that many will be thrown into the second death. But we, we will be the priest of God and of Christ. And will reign with him for a thousand years. I know we think these 70 to 80 years that we might have the benefit of getting are a difficult journey. Tiring, depressing sometimes, disappointing, discouraging. I mean, we can all sit here and talk about the messiness of our life and our family. Sometimes it downright stinks. But what did that say? We will sit on thrones. We will wear crowns. We will be his priests. We will be a holy nation. And we will reign with him for a thousand years. A thousand years. And we're just getting started. That's the millennial reign. And after that starts eternity. And we can't even have our minds blown by what that's going to be. So, the goal of our faith is the salvation of our souls. And we prove that best by the way that we love one another truly practically love one another. Heavenly Father, we're grateful today that we could look into your word and see these written words by the Apostle Peter who walked and talked with you. And he was really quite amazed at the people that he met around the Roman Empire who believed in you and loved one another even though they had not seen you. And then at the end of this statement he says, and the reason for all of this faith and hope and love is because it's culminating in the salvation of our eternal soul. And for that, we're so grateful, Lord Jesus. In his name, amen. As we close today, let me say a prayer of commitment, a prayer of change, a prayer of wanting to get involved in loving other people more than we ever have before. If you want to agree with that or be willing to try that, uh, follow me in prayer in your heart. Heavenly Father, we often live busy and discouraging lives. Things here on the planet aren't going so good. But Lord, we're looking forward to your return and your kingdom. This is where we pin our hope. Uh, Heavenly Father, for those of us here, myself included, Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll help our hearts take courage. You'll help our schedules make time. You'll help us invest in the people of God, in the kingdom of God, in the house of God, in the things of God. 
Lord, we have been distracted, discouraged, busy. Help us change that about ourselves. Help us to invest in other people and invest our time here in the ministries and in your house. Bring a change to our hearts. If you prayed that prayer, say with me, Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. You're dismissed. And if some guys will stick around to help us out, and the ladies are going to leave probably for luncheon. Thank you for coming today. God bless you.